interesting thing is this is what is happening. There is a intention behind it, right? So the farmer or the plant breeder is actually selecting the trait that they like. Now that is when I want to actually get into different variety um, of breeding um, because now I'm going to talk about different types of breeding, right? So we all hear something about genetically modified seeds, right? And I want to talk about how that's different. So in a genetically modified seed, what happens is that an unrelated organism's plant tissue is selected and inserted into another plant. So I, I'm gonna use an example, and this could be done using a gene gun or some other genetically engineered um, science. There's actually six to seven different ways of creating GMs, and I'm not familiar with them all. <clears throat> so essentially the plant tissue is inserted into the other plant, and those seeds are saved again for about six to seven generations. And then that seventh or ninth generation is sold in the market because then they know that that trait has consistently showed up for nine generations. So that means it's in the genetic makeup of that variety now. <clears throat> um, in India, a very common example of a GM seed is BT cotton, which means it's been bred to have resilience to BT, which is a type of um, bacterial uh, bacteria that shows up in the cotton plant. Um, I'm going to actually show you an example of a rice variety. So Dr. Debal Deb, I've cited him here at the bottom. He's actually um, a scientist himself who is actually conserving many, many different types of seeds. Um, his um, organization is called Rihi, but they've conserved 1400 varieties of native rice. So indigenous varieties, heirloom varieties of rice. So all these ones that you see in black, are native varieties that have been saved for generations through farmers. He has tested these different varieties to check for their iron and their zinc content. Now, if you see at the bottom most, there's one highlighted in red, which is called soy F-E-R-R-H-1 rice. So it's actually a rice variety that has a soy trait inserted into the rice, right? That's what makes it genetically modified. But the idea is that this soy is very high in iron. And India has a big anemia problem. So this was supposed to be a solution to our iron deficiency. But if you look at the iron quantities, um, some of our local varieties have almost 120 times more iron in it. So it's just because something is genetically modified or something is old and is a ancient variety, it, you, you have to understand that, I mean, there's pros and cons to both. So it's each individual obviously makes their choice on what they believe is beneficial. But here he's actually shown that there's local varieties that actually do an even better job of providing iron. So if we just try to find our local varieties that have these things, we can actually propagate them even more. So he shares seeds with farmers. He's amazing. I've actually also put, um, I've made a resources page at the end, which I will share with people. You can listen to his talk. I've actually put a link to it. Um, so all of that I will share with you later. Now conventional plant breeding is um, again, breeding that is done by scientists and um, researchers. It's usually done in a lab and there's no input from farmers, right? So it's done independently. They set the objectives, they choose the traits, they choose how they're the ones who do the planting in these research fields. Whereas participatory plant breeding is where farmers are part of the entire process. They actually help choose the objectives of the study or of the variety that they're going to try to be producing over generations. They'll say, hey, we need these kind of traits. I need a drought resistant rice variety because our, our monsoon has been changing so much. So let's try to develop a type of rice that is um, resistant to, you know, to, to lack of water. So they get to choose these things and traits that they're looking for. And then they get to plant it in their own fields and see the results and then give feedback to the researchers. So it's a very collaborative process. And then the final kind of breeding, which we have, I mean, we meaning us human beings have been doing for generations. And that is farmer breeding, which is when a farmer is planted wheat on his or her field and they see that they've actually had a very, very wet season. So in India, wheat is usually planted in the winter. So it's not as, it's not like rice is planted in the monsoon season. So wheat can actually get very dry. So if they see that actually this wheat has um, 
grown a little taller than the rest of my field. And I like that it's taller because when I harvest the grain, I can sell it. But then that remaining hay, I can feed to my cattle. So I like that this wheat is very tall. Someone else would be like, oh, my back is hurting. I don't want to be cutting such tall stalks of wheat. I want a shorter variety of wheat. So they will select from their field the shorter plants of wheat and save seeds from that. So do you, I hope you can see that there's a very active process that is going on where the farmer is making choices based on their needs, based on their environment, what they actually see and need and want from their plants and their crops. So they're kind of making these micro varieties that fit their microclimate, they fit their agroecological zone and they fit their needs because I have cattle, I have to feed them hay, might as well feed them what I'm growing in my field, right? So. I quickly want to show this quick example and there was a flood in Bengal in India a few years ago and this farmer was really proud because in his, his entire field it was all planted with the same variety of rice but this stock survived and so he saved the rice from this variety and him and Dr. Debal Deb um, together produced a variety of rice um, that can, can, can survive severe flooding. So, I mean, the, the, the water's up to his neck. And this is how tall this variety of rice is then. So again, it, it's a very, this would be an example of participatory plant breeding because the farmer took it to Dr. Debal Dave and then over successive generations, they developed it, they, you know, propagated it. So they had more quantities as well and they had to stabilize it. So now you know what all these words mean. And that's the intention. Um, so why save the seed, right? Like why save seeds? And that's the most important um, question that I get. And my answer to everyone is what I've just explained, is that then the power is in your own hands. You're not choosing a variety of tomato that is sitting on a counter and might not suit your needs, right? Or as a farmer, you might be picking a type of grain that doesn't suit your field or hasn't even adapted to your field because it was grown in a lab that is thousands and thousands of kilometers away. It has never even grown once in your microbiome. So it just doesn't make sense. But if a farmer has been planting it for years, the se my second point is that pl that plant variety would have adapted. So if there was a flood one year and certain plants of it survived, you save those seeds because it somehow has some built-in resilience. And then you propagate that for generations to come. It'll spread that across the, that variety then. So by these are my first two main points is that agency is given to the individual and secondly plants just like us human beings are always adapting to the minor changes and even the macro changes that are happening in the environment in the soil in climate and you know I'm not going to go into climate change but you know that's one big reason why plants should be I mean seeds should be saved um, then another reason, you know, I made this list, so I put it in the order that I like, but you know, you can move it around. The idea is that then if you're saving seed, you're also saving, you know, different varieties that, you know, maybe are not available in the market. So, you know, you get to, you get to propagate things that might not be so easily available. So you get to build on the diversity as like in the market you go today, there's only six varieties of rice available, but Dr. Deval Dev has 1400. At Navdanya, we have something like 900 varieties of rice. And these are in different parts of India. So can you imagine they've been adapted to entirely different um, climate zones? So and you're helping, and the other thing, well, it's important about diversity is that diversity begets diversity. So if you have diversity in your plant kingdom, you have diversity in your insect kingdom. You also then have diversity, it carries on into your animal kingdom, then it carries on to the microbes, and then it also carries on to us human beings. And one thing I really want to point out and um, is that diversity in, in our environment is also diversity in our culture. Right, because in India, and I mean, I'm obviously speaking from that context, is a lot of our festivals center around agriculture. There's the harvest festival, there's our planting festival, and then that connects to our religion. It also then connects to our sense of time and seasons, right? So that's how we delineate our year is based on harvest or or sowing or you know this is the time you fertilize. So if we start losing our plant diversity, we also start losing some of our cultural diversity. And that is because everything is connected. So that's another really important reason that I believe in saving seeds and I really encourage other people to. And then there's also more like political reasons, right? Like 
seed companies have a lot of power in their hands. They get to make a lot of decisions for farmers, for us, for the, on the market. And this way, you're, it's an, an immediate opposition to big ag um, or to these big corporations. Then there's also the added layer of you have a personal connection then to your garden because not you don't just stop at harvesting your tomato. You save your seed from your tomato and you plant it again. So you see the entire cycle and the entire cycle is enabled by you as well. You're an important integral part of your garden. And that's what's the, another beauty. And if you save seeds, I can pass it to my friend and my friend can pass it to their friend. And, you know, you build community and it's strengthened communities, right? Because sharing is caring. So that's one of the beautiful things about seeds is that, you know, it easily proliferates. I mean, one spreads around.